Thank you for having me, Jim. And uh, I certainly want to thank the uh, World Affairs Council for uh, hosting me today. It's very kind, very kind of you to do so. I always like uh, opening up my talks with a quote from my favorite author, who is uh, John Le Carre. He's the only fiction author that I do read. And Le Carre has a, a great line that uh, for those of you who have ever been in the military or in the intelligence community will understand completely. Everybody working in intelligence imagines that there's a real intelligence service somewhere else. <laughs> because those of us who are in the business really can't believe that this is all there is to get the job done. But uh, that's reality. Benghazi. It's a story of heroism and courage of young men under fire, trapped a long way from home. In many ways, they were modern day Travis's, Crockett's, and Bowie's. They knew exactly what they had, and they knew exactly the resources that they didn't have. And I think it's important to understand and put this in perspective because our reality at times is US centric and we think that by dialing 911 we could have help here in moments time. The reality of the State Department, specifically the special agents in the State Department, are that they realize that their backup at times can be an aircraft carrier away and they literally are on their own. In 1988 I was all of probably 25, 26, and I was dispatched to the Punjab of Pakistan to investigate the last U.S. ambassador killed in the line of duty before Ambassador Stevens, and that was Ambassador Arnie Rafel. He perished aboard a C-130 that went down in Bawalalapur, Pakistan, carrying President Zia of Pakistan a two-star U.S. Army general, and the entire Pakistani cabinet. Curiously, the infamous ISI director watched the plane crash from a smaller little beach craft that was hovering as the plane took off. The agent that was with me was 23, and I was 26. About three days into the investigation in this godforsaken little village, the State Department called me on my one call a day. It was back in the day when you had the old push-to-talk satellite secure phone. We could only catch the signal once a day. Some of you may remember that. And Foggy Bottom said, Burton, we have some troubling developments. You know how the State Department likes to talk. I said, well, how bad is it? And they said, well, we think there may be a nuclear war. And I said, well, let me guess. Is that between Pakistan and India? And they said, yes. And my response was, well, what are you going to do to get us out of here? <laughs> and Foggy Bottom said, well, we'll get back to you tomorrow. Now, those of you who have been in the government understand exactly what I mean when I say that. They had absolutely no plans to get us out of there quickly, nor did they have any idea how best to do that. We were on our own. Now, that's not unusual for agents from my old service that I feel very blessed to have been associated with for many years. In 1968, a young agent by the name of Bob Furry stood inside the U.S. Embassy compound in Saigon when it was overran, when the VC blew a hole in the perimeter wall and he opened up on the individuals coming through with a Thompson submachine gun. And another young agent by the name of Steve Bray, who I talk about in Under Fire, evacuated Ambassador Bunker to a safe haven. The VC never got to Ambassador Bunker. And they were clearly destined to kidnap the ambassador and put him on TV. Then in 1979, 
in Tehran, a young agent by the name of Al Golazinski was held hostage for better than a year. And he was blamed for the Iranian radical takeover of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. But there's always more to the story. Two weeks before the embassy takeover in Tehran, Iranian fanatics actually held more Americans hostage, stormed the compound, and tied up the Sharjah affairs. This was two weeks before the actual embassy seizure. Young Al Golazinski called back to Foggy Bottom and said, we can't protect this embassy. All I have is my Marine security guards and me. And I've got a nation against us. And the response back from Foggy Bottom was, Dr. Kissinger says you have a higher purpose. The embassy will remain open. Al's response was, well, Dr. Kissinger isn't here. <laughs> That's the realities of the ground in an organization like the Diplomatic Security Service. And that was the reality on the ground for our agents in Benghazi. All of them were under 30. All of them had rotated off of various other protection details. With the US, U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, at one point in time, we had 200 agents doing nothing but protection for the organization. The resources dictate that these agents just move from temporary assignment to temporary assignment. But let me clarify something quickly as it pertains to Benghazi. The moment that the first round was fired, the agents knew that this was a terrorist attack. That was sent via message text, telephone, and email to the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli. It was also conveyed back to the State Operations Center at Foggy Bottom, where we have hordes of agents now that staff the command post 24 by 7. And the agents followed their standard operating pr procedure as best they possibly can. What happened? I know many of you have lived overseas. There is no fire suppression equipment. There are no sprinklers. There is no fire department. There is no police to respond. There were no smoke hoods. That was a failure. In my assessment, that would have made a big difference, and they know it. Why weren't there any smoke hoods there? Something as simple as that. Endless temporary duty assignments. I'm sure many of you have been in the room, have been out on these. And it was an oversight because nobody expects that terrorist attack to take place on that given day. And nobody bothered to check to see if the smoke hoods had been there. The utilization of fire as a weapon was brilliant. There is brilliance in simplicity when it comes to these terrorist attacks. Fire was very successfully used as a terrorist attack in 79 in Islamabad when the U.S. Embassy was overran and burnt to the ground there. And actually, in the 1950s, the U.S. consulate in Benghazi had been set on fire. There's a long history of fire being utilized as a weapon. A lot easier to set a fire than it is to make a bomb. Where was the help? Where was the help? Help came. The quick rea reaction force manned by the CIA with contractors called from their group, the GRS, the Global Response Staff, did an amazing job, along with loyal militia response to make that run from the CIA base to the actual villa and try to search for Ambassador Stevens and Information Officer Smith. The agents, and I chronicle this in great detail in Benghazi because I think it's important. In many ways, I think they've been unfairly thrown under the bus. They lost track of how many times they went into this 
burning building repeatedly, at times tying rope to each other, a tow rope from one of their armored limousines. Crawling on broken glass, suffering lacerations and smoke inhalation to try to find Ambassador Stevens. At one point, they thought he'd been kidnapped. Their mental thought process at this time was that the terrorists had kidnapped Stevens. They found Smith's body and dragged him out, tried to resuscitate him, but he was long gone. Doesn't take much in that kind of smoke-filled smoke environment if you don't have good air. Good air was critical, and they didn't have it. What happened to Chris Stevens? The working theory is that he got turned around in the dark, in the chaos, and either got trapped in a little closet or an alcove or possibly even an armoire and couldn't get out. And he died there. That's where he died. But it wasn't for the want of effort on the part of the agents to try to help him. When the CIA team got there, they did a remarkable job going back in and out repeatedly. They put two lookouts on a, in a perch on the rooftop of the Tactical Operations Center called the TOC. I have diagrams in the book for you to see this. And they saw huge masses of people assembling on all their gates. And they said, we got to get out of here. We can't hold this position anymore. The initial plan was for them all to leave together, which not many people know. They were going to, the DS agents and the CIA personnel were going to motorcade over together back to the safe haven at the base. But the agents on the perch took a while to get down because they were firing at bad guys that were shooting at them. So the CIA team said, you guys go ahead, you guys go ahead. The agents run from the villa to the base was something out of a Mad Max movie. RPGs being fired at them, vehicle on fire, taking rounds. It's a real testament to the type of training that the State Department is now sending their personnel to. A lot better than it was when I went through as an agent. They did a remarkable job saving everybody's lives in the car just based on attack recognition when the terrorists tried to lure them into a trap down this one-way street. Amazing, amazing skills getting out of there, shortly to be followed by the CIA team. They got back to the base, and at all points along this line, the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli and the State Department Operations Center knows exactly what is taking place exactly what is taking place. Many of you in this room know how notifications work in Washington. It goes to everybody, to include the National Security Council. I know that for a fact. And then what happened? Sporadic fire throughout the night. Marine fast team general from Rota stood up to get there as fast as they could. The team was on the tarmac, set a while, waiting for country clearance, waiting for the go, got the green light to go, and started heading that way. Quick reaction team from the U.S. Embassy Tripoli did lean forward. They rented a C-130 and chartered it and got there as quickly as they can tremendous number of volunteers and heroes to include a nurse that responded. But as many people told me as to what happened next is we all know the realities of this kind of business. Nobody expected the mortars to fly. In essence, Washington was blindsided with the secondary attack with the mortars being fired, walked in, at the CIA base, and the mortars were walked in and killed the two former Navy SEALs, Glenn Daughtery, Tyrone Woods, 
and blew one of our agents off a ladder that was climbing up to the roof to also try to help the SEALs. And uh, he was hurt pretty bad. The tactical medical training that the agents had received was wonderful and in all probability saved that agent's life. That's the story of Benghazi. It's a story of young men put in a place that none of us would have wanted to be, like so many of our brave soldiers around the globe today, doing the best job they could, knowing that help was a long way away. But let me say this before I open it up for some questions. There's nobody that goes into this work that doesn't know that going in. Unlike any other federal law enforcement position, this one's unique. And at times, it does place you in harm's way. The State Department has a long history of this kind of attack and young agents trying to do the best they can. And at this point, I'll turn it over for any questions that anybody may have. Thank you, Fred. As you, as you know, we have a tradition. You have to wait just a second, General, to let a student from Hockaday ask the first question. Um, and I don't have the name, so when I read the question, if that student could stand up, please. Because there are a lot of questions along the same line. What was the initial reasoning behind announcing the act of terror as a riot? When did it become apparent that this was no longer the case and were we misled? Who asked that question? Somebody's being, right, okay, great. Are you trying to say that our government would lie? Uh, in reality, in fairness to Washington, another famous Lacar quote is, a desk is a dangerous place to watch the world. And we had several very violent protests throughout the Arabian Peninsula. And some of the impressions early on with the mobs that were outside Benghazi was that this was a demo or part of a demonstration. But in reality, the facts indicate that the information was conveyed back to Washington within probably a minute and a half that the special mission compound in Benghazi was under a terrorist attack. And that's pretty specific. I have no explanation for how the narrative changed because individuals in that um, decision-making tree I did not have access to. But I also think it's important to wind back the clock and look at this in the context of a pending presidential election and the politics surrounding it. And let's see, we have microphones tonight, Joss? So you had a question, sir, if you'll wait for the microphone. Uh, Fred, a lot, of, a lot of military people I know would like to know uh, what military assets were available in the Mediterranean and uh, were they put in on alert and uh, could they have gotten there in time and why not? In looking at that, this is really a, a study in contingency planning as well as um, game boarding of logistics. Meaning, I believe that the U.S. Marine fast team out of Rota could have launched a little bit sooner. But giving the State Department the benefit of the doubt and having worked to get country clearances and overflight clearances, that is not an easy process. And in order for the Marines to go into Libya, in essence, the State Department would have had to make a unilateral decision to send armed U.S. Marines into Libya without country clearance. And uh, that decision was not made to do that at that time. There's one other group that uh, I've been a part of and some of you in this room may have in the past. It's called the FEST the Forward Emergency Support Team. That deploys out of Andrews Air Force Base. 
immediately whenever any U.S. embassy comes under attack or if there's a potential of a hostage taking. If you remember, the agents thought Ambassador Stevens had been kidnapped for a long period of time. A long period of time. A decision was made at Foggy Bottom not to launch the FEST from Andrews Air Force Base because they were fearful that the FEST going into a non-permissive environment would have been difficult and so they chose not to launch the FEST. Again, that's coming from Andrews Air Force Base. On a practical level, I don't think anybody from any response force other than the CIA base could have done anything to help Ambassador Stevens or Information Officer Smith or the five agents that were there. On a practical level, I think that it's feasible, if you look at the logistics, the Marines from Rota could have possibly gotten there a little bit quicker. We'll never know the answer to that story. The discussion of overflight, flying a, a, a jet fighter over Benghazi uh, was also discussed, but was ruled out that this was very little that they thought that that would accomplish, to be blunt. The drones were all unarmed and uh, was watching. And in fact, before the mortars were fired, the drone footage did not indicate any hostiles on the perimeter. It kind of came out of nowhere. And uh, as many people told me that were in the, involved in that decision making, they said we literally were shocked that the mortar attacks occurred. Could something more have been done? I think that in reality, short of the Marines getting there quicker, probably not. Probably not. I will say this, to follow up on that, because it's a point of contention, depending on what, which side of the aisle you're on, that uh, the C-130 that came from Tripoli with the JSOC operators and the CIA staff got there as fast as they could, but then were held up at the airport in Benghazi because the militia group, how do I put this diplomatically, wanted cash. And they spent a long time at the airport trying to find the right person to, in essence, pay off in order to get the heck out of the airport. Some of you who have operated in the, that world understand how that is. Let me ask this question, and Anthony will we'll get the microphone to you. Should Ambassador Stevens have gone to Benghazi? I think in retrospect, retrospect no. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this, who may have been in the Foreign Service or associated with the Foreign Service, are very familiar with what is called Chief of Mission Authority. Under Chief of Mission Authority, the U.S. Ambassador to whatever designated country is the President's personal representative to that country, and he is, by statute and by State Department Foreign Affairs Manual, responsible for the, the safety and welfare of all official Americans in country, to include himself. There is also a report that has not been released. It's called the Classified Accountability Review Board. We have seen the Public Accountability Review Board, but the State Department has not released the Classified Accountability Review Board or made public the Accountability Review Board for reasons unbeknownst to me, but I understand that it, it's political. And before I forget, there is an important part to this story which I think is critical that, um, how do I put this diplomatically, somewhat infuriates me since I started the Rewards for Justice program, which is the 20 million for bin Laden. Here we are more than a year and the State Department has failed to offer a reward for information pertaining to the suspects linked to the killing of Ambassador Stevens Information Officer Smith and the former Navy SEALs. It's tied up in foggy bottom bureaucracy, which can somewhat explain why you can't move assets from point A to point B quickly and a host of other different reasons. But 
how it's taken a year to get something as simple as a reward offer is beyond me. I expect uh, that issue to be raised on the Hill this week when certain senior State Department people testify. That's appalling. Anthony, you'll wait for the microphone. Oh, you got the microphone. Great. Oh, I'll yell loudly, all right? Uh, that works. As someone who spent a lifetime from a military point of view and an intelligence point of view, I find this entire escapade from Jim's question about why in the world is he there on 9-11, away from where he should have been, to this whole thing about the QRF, Marines, and also not having demonstrations above Benghazi of fighter aircraft, whether they shot anybody or not. Totally abysmal. It seems to me there was a breakdown, and I've got to ask if you could answer this question, between uh, yes, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with your comments in that uh, I, I, I can tell you that, that responding to active terrorist attacks, and I've done that countless occasions, my entire career was that was the process is really geared down to, at minimum, the deputies committee, meaning the deputy secretary of state, the deputy sec def. Uh, but the NSC does control a lot. And if the NSC wants a plane sent from Andrews from here to Timbuktu, a plane is sent. Uh, I think that there, there was chaos and a lack of, of contingency planning to envision what would happen in the event that something like this occurred. Meaning, if you looked at the emergency action plans for the agents that were there, it was cover and evacuate the ambassador to the safe haven. They did that. Then if the safe haven falls, it's to take the ambassador over land to Egypt, if memory serves me right. I remember reading the SOP for that. And that was it. So you get back to the special mission compound and this notion of expeditionary diplomacy. Benghazi was one of, one of more than 20 posts just like it, which had had security waivers that were not up to, to physical security standards. And I think that that contributed greatly and uh, also the lack of fire suppression equipment, and also the lack of counter surveillance assets on the perimeter looking for pre-operational surveillance as part of the attack cycle. That program started on my watch. You put agents out on the perimeter and you look for pre-operational surveillance. The five agents in Benghazi had no intelligence that this was happening. You had one agent with Stevens and Smith in the, in the villa. You had one agent in the tactical operations center watching the cameras. And he was a hero, by the way. We talk about that in the book. He was able to see the terrorists on the compound through the surveillance cameras. He was able to tell the other agents where they were. Move here. Don't move there. Don't open that door. They're right outside your door. And then the three agents were on their downtime, were literally sitting on a patio smoking cigars when the first round was fired. They had absolutely no idea that this was coming. So you had a failure of your concentric rings of security with no capable agents on the perimeter looking for this to unfold, or I'm convinced that that certainly would have helped too. Those resources were removed by Washington and moved elsewhere. When were they moved? Jim, I have it in the book, and I just don't recall off the top of my head. What was the distance between the special mission facility where Stevens was and the base camp? Uh, where was it that the two SEALs were killed? And can you elaborate a little bit on their role? Sure. Uh, the, the base was, if memory serves me right, about 1.2 miles. Might, be, uh, might have been a little less as a crow flies. If you set up the uh, overhead imagery of the locations, uh, pretty straight shot. Unfortunately, this was uh, chaos that night with people milling about, a large uh, blocks of people in the street. 
um, it was difficult getting from the CIA base to the actual villa. In reality, again, back to Ambassador Stevens and Smith, I think that there was nothing that could have been done even in that period of time based on the size of the fire. If you look at how they died, Daughtery and Woods, the two SEALs, former SEALs killed, were on the roof of the CIA annex, which was their safe haven. When they evacuated the agents and Smith's body back to the base, they climbed up on the roof to look at the sporadic fire that was taking place throughout the night. They were killed when the mortars came in and the mortars were walked in on them and they hit dead center, literally. Joe, if you wait for the microphone because we are podcasting. <laughs> um, the uh, Benghazi was the beneficiary, the people of Benghazi were the beneficiary of a lot of American support during the recent Civil War. And um, I would think that logically that we as Americans would have won some points with them uh, because of our support. But my question really is, why did we not see any reaction from the local uh, authorities or local militias or, or coming to the aid of the master extensions? Uh, everything I read was that he was beloved by the people of Benghazi. And I don't understand why the fire department didn't roll, the police department didn't come, or, you know, local militias didn't show up. The only local militia that showed up with it was the one on the CIA's payroll. Uh, the initial attack, the uh, perimeter guards, basically Libyan nationals that were unarmed, <laughs> that were unarmed, opened the gates that allowed, uh, in essence, Ansar al-Sharia, al-Qaeda, onto the compound. There was no police. Um, there was no friendly militia other than the ones that the CIA owned that actually did help not only uh, respond from the CIA base with the CIA GRSers, but they also uh, worked diligently to try to recover Ambassador Steven's body from not only the, the villa, but subsequently at the hospital when it was determined that Stevens had been taken there. The place was on a slow boil with just warnings and indicators that in retrospect become that frog in the pot where you have the threat fatigue of living in a high threat, dangerous place every day. And it's just another threat, meaning it's just another threat. In order for us to do our job, we have to work around the threats. The threats are not going to stop. And it's hard to explain unless you've lived in that business. Some of you in this room understand what I mean. It's, okay, so Al-Qaeda is planning to kill us. Well, when are they not planning to kill us? We've still got a job to do. And that term is called threat fatigue in the business. If you look at the incidents leading up to the attack, to include the bombing of the perimeter, which had been perpetrated by one of our own guards, you realized you had a security problem that was beyond our control. Remember, by G Geneva Convention, it is the host nation's responsibility to provide security for all official Americans in, in country. Then you get into the legalese of, OK, did we really have a Libyan government to work with? Had Ambassador Stevens pre presented his credentials? Was he recognized as a diplomat? But who's going to recognize him amongst the 25 different militia groups? So why is he in Benghazi to begin with? Well, he chose to go to Benghazi. It was discussed in Tripoli, and nobody said no. A travel cable went to Washington that said the ambassador will be in Benghazi on 9-11. Nobody said no. In retrospect, he shouldn't have been there. But we have the benefit of hindsight. And the Canadians and the British had withdrawn their diplomats. Correct. Even the Iranians had pulled out. You've done a tremendous job explaining what's been bothering me. I have one question. You mentioned that 
I think uh, uh, Foggy Bottom would probably answer that by saying, um, well, let me, let me answer that question. I can't speak for Foggy Bottom. I don't have an answer for you, sir, on that question, but I do know that they knew that it was a terrorist attack. I, I, I don't have an explanation. I, I think politics, personally. I think uh, it was off message. I think that uh, might have been a little bit of wishful thinking. Might have been a little bit, let's, you see, this is where it gets really interesting when you ask that, is you would have to assume that information pertaining to this being a terrorist attack was very quickly pushed up the chain of command. Maybe not in writing, maybe not in email, but at least orally. I don't know the answer to why certain statements were made. I can't speak for, for Foggy Bottom. I can't speak for Susan Rice going on the talk shows and, and saying something different. I think those are the kinds of questions that need to be asked. But let me say this. It is easy to point your finger at certain players in this scenario. But do you realize that Congress, the House Intelligence Committee, has only called one CIA person that was in Benghazi to testify? One. So someone needs to ask them why they haven't called more people to provide open testimony as to exactly what the CIA was doing in Libya and to get more details as to what took place that night. I know how Washington works. If the committees wanted it to make it happen, like ESA, who has been on this for the better part of a year, it can be done. I have a question over here. And my question, and in line with what you just mentioned, you know, it's twofold. Uh, was the CIA on a covert mission in Benghazi to recover some weapon that had fallen in the wrong hand, that we had shipped and had fallen in the wrong hand, and uh, that Ambassador Stevens knew about that covert operation. I appreciate your comments on that. The State Department agents were not aware of any CIA covert activities in country, but they would not necessarily have knowledge of that to begin with if, in fact, it was a compartmented operation. A good number of people that Sam and I spoke to said that that was one of the topics that constantly came up. Now, you had a pretty good-sized base there, about 30, large base, a fair number of GRS contractors. So you get back to what does a GRS contractor do? They're very well paid. And the persons that do that job are pretty darn good at what they do. Former SEALs, former Marine Recon, Special Operations kind of persons. They typically are providing surveillance detection coverage for case officers meeting human assets. So, for example, if I was meeting you here at this hotel, the GRS team would be watching my back to make sure that I'm not being set up, that you haven't been followed to the meeting, and that both of us are going to get killed at this event. So there is no doubt that they were involved in human intelligence collection, which is what the CIA does. It's also pretty good, uh, how, or how do I phrase this better? It's, it's pretty realistic that they were also trying to recover weapons that had fallen in to Libyan al-Qaeda hands due to the fall of Gaddafi. So in essence, they were trying to recover, pay for information, or pay to get these weapons back. The other narrative that has been persistent, that I can find nobody who can confirm this, is that the CIA was actually funneling weapons to the Syrian rebels. 
And that was what they were also doing in Benghazi. I don't know. If I was on the uh, House Intelligence Committee, I would know, want to know the answers to those questions. But so far, they haven't chose to ask those questions. And so you have to ask yourself, why? I don't know the answer to that question. But I also know that for the bulk of the people that have been interviewed on the Hill, my list would have been a lot different. We all know the higher you go up in the government, the less and less anybody really knows. You have to make. Yes, sir, with the microphone. The, um, I don't know if you've actually specifically answered this statement, but do you feel that that night's attack was premeditated? Yes. As a public? And if so, if it was planned, yes. as other people have said, this was a, a city that, in a town where we had been very supportive, we had assets, we had intelligence. We had relationships. How could that have been planned? And our agencies plural, totally missed the intelligence on the ground. I think uh, much like Boston, much like uh, Fort Hood and Major Hassan, much like today at the Washington Naval Yard, you have intelligence failures. There, there are two fundamental aspects that it's been my experience breakdown in the course of any investigation on a terrorist attack. You have a failure of tactical analysis, meaning you have collected the information, but you failed to make sense of what you've collected. Or point two is a failure of human intelligence. You don't have assets that is going to report that this individual today at the Washington Navy Yard was planning to do what he did. Those two variables are in every terrorist attack I've looked at, whether it's been failed or successful. A lack of tactical analysis and a lack of human intelligence. And um, muddied a, a great deal, too, by the FBI pursuit of uh, these crimes as, as actual a violation of US law. Why is that important? Well, look at it this way. If you send an FBI team to investigate what happened in Benghazi, who, by the way, were held up in Tripoli because they had other VIP delegations there that had come in and strapped their limited resources already. So the FBI, who was protected by State Department agents, were delayed getting to Benghazi. When the FBI conducts an interview, they are solely focused on the suspects for the purposes of criminal investigation. They're not asking the question of, help me understand Agent X, why there were no smoke hoods there. Help me understand, as I look at Ambassador Stevens' schedule, who was this individual with the shipping company that he met with? Those aren't the kind of questions that get asked. The FBI is taking a surveillance picture of a suspect that was on the compound and saying, did you see him kill any Americans? So our whole response to this kind of phenomena is not what people think it is. We have time for two more questions. Jemison, we'll take one here and then you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, your years in the Foreign Service, the CIA portion of the Foreign Service, uh, and the experiences that you've had you, from an early age, and the amount of money that we're spending that we know about, and then the amount that we know, don't know about. Are we getting our money's worth? All the things that you have said lead me to believe that I've been one that supported, that I've been wanted to support just about anything the CIA wanted uh, and needed. But it looks like to me that we are spending a lot of money and not getting much value for that money spent. And what is your assessment? Well, I think that uh, trying to follow the, the black budgets, the, the clandestine money, um, it would take uh, all of us for the rest of our lives to try to figure out where all that is going on any given day. But in, in reality, I think that if you look at how the money is spent and for what purposes, 
there's not a tremendous amount of oversight as to how that's spent. If you and I are at the CIA and we're involved in some sort of black project, project we brief cleared personnel on the Hill, and that's pretty much all that it's somewhat required. There's not a lot of oversight as to how that money is spent. So you don't know if you're being successful or not. And it does cost money to be successful in some of these projects, meaning I paid an informant $1.2 million in cash to give me Ramsey Yosef, the mastermind of the first World Trade Center bombing. Would he have done it without the money? Probably not. So you, you have to spend money like that in order to, to get results, which is somewhat infuriating when you look at why no State Department reward offer for the suspects that killed Ambassador Stevens. That should have happened the first month. About six months into this, the FBI reportedly said, we're going to offer a reward. And they did. If you look at the FBI's website, I have some pictures in, in the book. But they offered not a lot of money. So you have systemic kind of process failure when it comes to that. And there's over 20 people on the committee to decide who is going to offer a reward and whether or not that's justified. Some of you, General, for example, have been at the Pentagon. Can you get 20 people to agree on anything? Can 20 of us in this room agree on anything? Ma'am, last question. Yes, I'm always interested in the media coverage and with almost every event, the media descends on every person that's ever been involved, even tangentially. And it seems interesting that none of the people who were there appear to ever have been approached by the media, or maybe I've just missed that news story. No, you haven't. And I talk about this in the introduction of the book. I know, I, I know who these agents are. They don't want to be interviewed. They have moved on with their careers. Uh, in fact, uh, many have immediately transferred on to more dangerous places, believe it or not, if you could say that. Uh, one of them is uh, injured very badly at Walter Reed. Um, he's been publicly identified. I'm not going to identify him. You can find his name if you really want to know. I just felt it was not the right thing to do um, out of respect for what they've lived through already and knowing that this will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Look, at the end of the day, they lost their protectee, much like the agents did at Dealey Plaza losing Kennedy. This is a person that they tried desperately to save and couldn't for whatever reason. So I, I didn't feel it was appropriate to identify them. Thank you very much, Fred. Thank you, Jim.